Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to be talking about preparing a contested guardianship case for trial. And this means that we're really going to be talking more about how to organize your files, um, some ethical issues that you may be confronting, when to start trial preparation, and more focusing on procedural issues uh, than as than uh, substantive issues. But um, when it's time to ask questions, we'll certainly try to deal with uh, whatever issues you um, are currently experiencing or may experience in the future or may have come uh, across in the past. So one of the main things that you need to focus on from the start when you are asked to represent somebody in a contested guardianship matter is whether you will be a necessary witness. Um, because the model rules of professional conduct in your state may or may not follow the model rules, but chances are you have something similar if your state doesn't. An attorney cannot act as an advocate at a trial in which the attorney is also likely to be a necessary witness unless there are um, certain factors. Number one, that the, trust, the testimony that you would give relates to an uncontested issue, that the testimony relates to the nature and value of legal services rendered in the case, or that the disqualification would work a substantial hardship on the person, um, but the model rules of professional conduct say it's perfectly fine for an attorney to try the case if another lawyer in the firm is likely to be called as a witness unless precluded by 1.7 or 1.9, and those provisions deal with um, conflict of interest and duties to a former client. So for example, let's assume that you had represented a client in connection with their uh, estate planning and you drafted a will or a trust and a power of attorney and a health care proxy five years ago and now the agent under a power of attorney is faced with a lawsuit by another family member who has brought an application for guardianship because they believe that the agent under the power of attorney has not been acting appropriately, and that agent now wants you to represent him or her in this contested guardianship action. So you need to think about whether, in fact, there would be a conflict in doing so um, since you had previously represented uh, the alleged incapacitated person. I believe that one should start trial preparation the first day that you get the case. If you know that a case is contested, um, by starting on the first day you get it, you can refine your legal theories and you can evaluate the evidence. And even if you don't try the case, you will be able to gather facts to support perhaps a summary judgment motion or a settlement pro, uh, position if the case is either um, uh, sent for mediation or arbitration or there is some sort of uh, settlement conference that the judge has uh, initiated. So in, typically when you have a contested guardianship, it's going to fall into one of two categories. Either the alleged incapacitated person is going to contest, alleging that, in fact, they are not incapacitated, um, or it's going to be an interested party who is contesting. It may be an interested party who is alleging that the um, alleged incapacitated person is not incapacitated, but more likely it will be an issue of, yes, the person is incapacitated, who should serve as the guardian, or the person has um, properly executed a power of attorney, um, which is valid and therefore does not need a guardian. So you need to think about, in the first instance, um, what the contest is all about and what the issues are all about. And so one of the first things you want to do is investigate the facts 
and that usually involves locating relevant documents and interviewing witnesses. Now, your client is going to come in and tell you a story, but sometimes clients do not tell the whole story. They may have left out facts that you might believe are very germane to the case. They may not tell you what those facts are, either because they don't think that it's relevant and you haven't asked the question, or um, sometimes they just don't want you to know and think it will never come out. It's very important if you're trying a contested case to know the good parts and the bad parts of your case. It is rare that a case is black or white. People don't generally conduct their lives thinking about future litigation. They may not have done things 100% correctly, and it's important to your case to be able to know what those issues are ahead of time. And so um, many of us have gotten burned with um, not asking the right questions from time to time. For example, um, is your client a convicted felon? If your client was a convicted felon, even if they were appointed guardian, they may not be able to get the required bond. Um, so as much as it is uncomfortable asking your client whether, for example, um, they are a convicted felon or those kinds of questions, it is truly necessary and relevant in these kinds of cases to get that information. The other thing is that the facts as told to you by your client may or may not be corroborated by others, and there will be a difference in the weight of the evidence and the strength of the different testimony or documentation. So you need to consider that. Now, when you are interviewing witnesses, you must consider the communications that you are going to have with people who are represented by counsel. And in general, you cannot speak to a person who is represented by counsel unless you have permission from that attorney to speak to their client. You can't just pick up the phone and call that person. There's also a rule of professional conduct, 4.3, that deals with re uh, representing an unrepresented person. It's very important to let that unrepresented person know that you do not represent them. Um, and you need to disclose what your interests are in speaking to that person, and you can't give them legal advice. And they're going to ask you for legal advice. Should I testify? Should I say this? Should I say that? So you have to be very, very careful in terms of interviewing witnesses. So in general, a contested guardianship will look like a regular lawsuit, depending on what jurisdiction you are in. And so you will have to draft a complaint or an answer or response or an affidavit or something, depending on what your jurisdiction requires. And keep the trial in mind. What are the allegations that have been made that you are responding to? What are the allegations that you are making? What is the relief requested? And how are you going to prove each and every allegation that you have set forth in your pleading? So you need to plead elements of each claim and each affirmative defense so that you are not precluded from asserting those claims or defenses at trial. This means that you need to be familiar with the types of pleadings that are required in your particular jurisdiction. You also need to be familiar with the evidence rules that apply in your particular case. In some jurisdictions, there's going to be a trial by jury. In other jurisdictions, there won't be a jury trial. So for example, I practice in the state of New Jersey and even though we have a statute that says that all guardianship um, actions, the alleged incapacitated person has a right to 
to demand a trial by jury in the history of 30 years of my practice, I have never seen a jury trial in the state of New Jersey, nor do I know anybody who has ever seen that in the context of a guardianship action. In other states, it's much more common to have jury trials. In some states, the um, rules of evidence may be somewhat relaxed. In other states, it's going to be uh, very strictly adhered to. So you'll have to be familiar with the rules of evidence governing the trial in your case and have an understanding of whether those rules will be relaxed or strictly enforced. So one of the things that you'll want to do right off the bat is deal with discovery. And discovery is basically where you are trying to gather facts that are going to help you to resolve this action. And your specific jurisdiction or a court order will dictate what kind of discovery you are entitled to. Your state may require initial disclosures where people need to give the other side certain information right from the start. You may be entitled to um, propound interrogatories. If you haven't done that already, um, chances are you learned in law school that those are a list of questions that you are entitled to ask the other side that are generally reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So you may want to know, for example, are there going to be any experts testifying? Who are the people who have knowledge of the facts that are alleged in this case? Um, all different kinds of questions, um, you know, uh, specifically related to perhaps the pleadings and the facts that have been alleged in the pleadings. For document, and, and one of the things that you want to know about the interrogatories is how many can you propound and can they have subparts? So your jurisdiction may tell you that or a court order may give you that information. You can request documents. You may want to get medical records. You may want to get medical reports. Um, these are very important documents. You may want to get um, prior powers of attorney or health care proxies or wills or trusts that were executed previously by the alleged incapacitated person. So make up a list of what you think you will need um, to prove your case. Requests for admission are basically where you set forth uh, certain statements and you ask the other side to either admit those statements or deny those statements so that you know when you go to trial what facts are in dispute and what facts um, there are no disputes and can be stipulated to thereby shortcutting and streamlining the trial in the area. And then there are depositions and uh, depositions are basically as I'm sure you all know, a situation where you have a court reporter in an office or in a more informal setting, it could even be a room in the courthouse, where the attorney is going to ask the witness a series of questions. And those questions can encompass hearsay and be much more broad than they can be at trial. Um, depositions are costly, and you can decide, depending on what your jurisdiction allows or what the court order allows, which of these discovery methods you want to engage in, how much money is involved, what, um, what does the uh, trial in this case need, what do you need in order to prevail. So discovery should be directed to the evidence you need to prevail at trial. It is not supposed to be a fishing expedition where you have no idea of what the facts are going to be. You have to have a game plan of where you want to be and how are you going to get those documents that are going to support your position or the testimony that is going to support your position. 
In adducing discovery, you may have to have subpoenas issued to third parties who may not want to testify voluntarily. You may want to uh, subpoena the attorney who was the scrivener of certain documents. You need to think about who you will want as a witness, and generally there are two types of subpoenas. There is a subpoena ad testificandum where you are looking for testimony from the witness, and there are um, the other kind of subpoena is a subpoena ducis tecum where all you are asking for is the production of documents and you are not looking for testimony. So, for example, you may want to um, have a subpoena issued uh, for the production of documents from the custodian of medical records at XYZ Hospital. You may not want the custodian of records to actually appear at a deposition. You need to be familiar with the rules that govern subpoenas in your jurisdiction. So, for example, in New Jersey, we are not permitted for discovery purposes to issue subpoenas, um, ducis tecum, to just ask for the production of documents. We must also ask for testimony. We can cancel the testimony if we have the documents that we need, but we can simply say produce the documents. So become familiar with what is required in your particular state. Depositions, you have to decide when you want to have those depositions. Most litiga litigators will schedule depositions after they get the paper discovery, after they get the responses to interrogatories, after they get the documents that they have requested be produced. But you get to decide how you want to do that. Obviously, if you want to ask the witness about documents that you have not already seen, it makes sense to wait for the production of the documents before you take the deposition. And you need to consider whether, in your jurisdiction, it would be helpful to obtain affidavits from the witnesses. So you have to consider whether the witnesses will actually be available for trial and how to introduce their testimony at trial and whether you will be able to do so by the use of affidavits instead of live testimony. With depositions, you will need to decide, for example, if the person is not going to be available, whether you want to have a videotape uh, deposition and your jurisdiction should have rules um, for how to go about doing videotape depositions if that is where you want to go. Now, one of the things that you're going to have to decide is whether the alleged incapacitated person should testify, can testify. If the alleged incapacitated person is going to testify, will there have to be any accommodations made in the courtroom? There are reasons why you may want to have the person testify. So let's say that the person uh, your client is contesting the guardianship, you are representing the alleged incapacitated person, and they are taking the position that they are competent, and you believe that um, they should testify and answer questions to prove that they don't need to have a guardian appointed. You are going to have to think about, will this person make a good witness? Will they help their case or hurt their case? You will need to decide, do you need hearing amplification devices? Perhaps they're competent, but they are hard of hearing. Are they going to be afraid of the process, even if they are competent? Can you, for example, arrange to have them testify from counsel table instead of going to the witness stand? Maybe they are um, unable to walk very well and there are stairs leading to the witness seat, and they can't really negotiate with a walker uh, those stairs. Sometimes um, the elderly person who is hard of hearing is helped if they can view a computer screen 
that transcribes what everybody is saying in real time. So think about whether you're going to have the person testify and whether accommodations will um, need to be made. Sometimes a person is going to want to testify and they really are not going to be able to do a good job in helping themselves. So uh, think about that and have a discussion with your client about that. So many times in contested guardianships, we need to consider whether there is a need for expert witnesses. You may, for example, need the testimony of the person's treating physician or perhaps the psychiatrist or neurologist who evaluated the person um, to make a, a pine on the person's competency. Um, there may be a psychologist who has evaluated the person or perhaps a geriatric care manager. So expert witnesses generally are going to want to be paid and uh, they're going to want to be, have retainers and so you're going to need to think about whether those people are important. If you get the medical records, is it going to be sufficient to just have those medical records given to a judge without any testimony? Who is going to be able to testify as to the contents of those medical records? Is it sufficient? Can they speak for themselves? Uh, you're going to have to make those kinds of decisions on how to deal with that. So one of the things that you're going to want to do if you're going to have an expert witness is you're going to want to interview the proposed witness and there's questions that you should ask. They're pretty routine. You're going to want to know whether the doctor, the psychologist, the physician, the geriatric care manager whoever it is, whether they have ever been found liable for malpractice. And the reason that you want to know that is because when you tell the other side who your expert is going to be, there's a good chance that they are going to research that person and they're going to find out that information. So you want to know ahead of time. You never want to be blindsided um, at trial and in general the rules of evidence do not let Perry Mason type of proceedings occur where you have surprise witnesses and surprise testimony. That only generally happens if you haven't asked the right questions in advance. You want to know whether your expert witness has experience testifying at trial, and if so, what type of cases do they testify in? Do they always, for example, testify for uh, the plaintiff, uh, perhaps on the side of the alleged incapacitated person who is taking the position that they are not incapacitated, or are they uh, always testifying that somebody is incapacitated? Do they have any relationship with the attorneys? that are involved in the case with any of the clients, with any of the other witnesses? What is his or her fee for rendering an opinion? And what is the fee for having that expert appear at trial? When you are interviewing this person, you will also want to think about whether that person is going to be a good witness or a bad witness. How do they respond to your questions when you ask them? Is it like pulling teeth? Are they personable? If you're going to try the case in front of a jury, is the jury going to like your witness? Is this person going to be speaking over the heads of the jury members? Or is this person going to be able to explain what has just transpired or what their opinion is to the lay people who are sitting on the jury. What is this person's qualification? Are they someone who is competent from an expert 
standpoint to testify. In general, an expert witness is assisting the trier of fact in coming to a determination. Does that person have qualifications that they actually know and understand whatever the subject matter is that they are going to testify about? And are they going to be able to explain that in a meaningful way to the trier of fact? So one of the things that you're going to have to be familiar with if you are going to use expert witnesses in your contested guardianship case are privilege issues. There are differences in general on how the rules of evidence deal with consulting experts versus testifying experts. So a consulting expert generally is someone that you have consulted with maybe to get a handle on a specific medical diagnosis or fact, but you do not intend to use that person at trial. And so in general, such communication are protected from disclosure when the purpose is ob to obtain legal advice. Your jurisdiction may have different rules for consulting experts, but you need to figure out whether you are going to have to disclose those communications to the other side or any kind of work product that is disseminated if you are not actually going to use that kind of expert to testify at trial. On the other hand, materials um, that are disclosed to a testifying expert generally must be disclosed to the adversary whether or not the expert actually considered those materials in rendering his or her opinion. So again, you're going to want to consult the applicable rules of evidence on experts in your jurisdiction, decide whether you're going to want to use that expert simply as a consulting expert or as a testifying expert, and then consider what kind of materials you are going to be giving to that expert because those materials are going to have to be disclosed in all probability to your adversary. I want to spend um, just a couple of uh, minutes on talking about net opinions and what net opinions are. So an expert opinion must be based on facts or data. And their conclusions, unsupported by factual evidence or other data, is generally considered to be inadmissible. Now, you can give a, an expert a hypothetical situation, and they can opine on that hypothetical type of situation. But if you are asking an expert to, or an expert gives you a conclusion that is not supported by factual evidence or other data, then that generally is going to be rendered inadmissible. And let me give you an example of um, how this might work. So I had a case where I was the court-appointed attorney in a contested guardianship situation, and a, a, a doctor had rendered an opinion after evaluating this person for competency. And the person who had hired this expert was actually the proponent of the guardianship. And that expert said, and, and it was the alleged incapacitated person, my client, who was contesting the guardianship, who had her own treating physician render reports that said that, in fact, she was competent could um, make decisions for herself and did not need a guardian. 
this particular expert from the proponent of the guardianship application also opined that the person was competent. However, the doctor stated that this person needed help in managing and administering her medication and therefore a guardian should be appointed for the limited purpose of making sure that this person took um, her medication. I argued that that part of the expert's report was a net opinion because there was no evidence at all that this person had any problem in managing or administering her medications to herself. This conclusion that the doctor came up with was not supported by any factual evidence or data that was adduced by anybody. And the judge agreed and did not um, believe that that portion of the opinion was admissible and therefore the court declined to appoint somebody to assist that person as a guardian for purposes of having this person take their uh, medication. So once you have your witnesses in place, um, you also are going to want to think about who you are going to have as fact witnesses. And your fact witnesses are often going to be determined by the events that took place that lead to the conclusion that the person needs or does not need a guardian, whatever the issues are in the case. And one of the most helpful things that you can do is to create a timeline. You prepare a chronology of important facts, and you fill in the chronology with facts that are reduced through the discovery process. And when you do that, you think about what, who are the witnesses that you are going to need and what are the documents that you are going to need to actually prove that these events occurred or did not occur, whatever the situation is. It will also be very helpful to you in preparing your statement of facts if you're briefing the case or your opening statement if you get to make an opening statement. It will help you organize your case in a meaningful, cohesive fashion. You'll want to prepare a case summary as well. And the case summary is invaluable for drafting motion, um, for drafting statements if the case is going into mediation or arbitration, and also for opening statements. You think about what it is, what are the main points that you are going to have to make to the trier of fact or to the person who is mediating the case or trying to uh, assist in the resolution of the case. In preparing for trial, you are going to want to review a lot of information. In many cases, you have worked on other matters while you are getting your case ready for trial, and you may not remember, <coughs> excuse me, everything that has been done or all of the documents that you have. So you're going to want to spend a lot of time preparing for trial. If you're fortunate enough to have a legal assistant or a paralegal help you with this process, that's great but ultimately you are going to have to be the one who is very familiar with all of the facts and all of the documents if you're going to try this case. So you're going to want to review the deposition transcripts that uh, you received after the deposition 
and you're going to want to look at the information that was collected in discovery. I generally um, like to prepare questions for direct and cross-examination, and frankly, I usually prepare a, an outline for deposition questions in advance of taking a deposition as well. So you're going to want to think about the questions that you're going to ask on direct examination and the questions you are going to ask other witnesses on cross-examination. Now remember that the rules of evidence in your jurisdiction will um, tell you the types of questions that you can ask. So for example, where you may have been able to ask questions eliciting hearsay at a deposition or questions that are broad brush um, of an adversary, you're going to want to handle questioning much differently at trial. Generally, direct examination questions have to be broad brush. You can't ask questions where you're just trying to elicit a yes or no answer on direct. You can't feed the witness or lead the witness with um, leading questions. You are, for the most part, going to have to prepare your witness to know ahead of time the types of questions that you are going to want. So a good way of doing that is to actually prepare a script. Now on cross-examination, you will be able to ask leading questions, and you will usually want to simply elicit yes or no questions. It is very, very important to remember that you may run into a serious problem if you ask a witness a question that you do not know the answer to. You may not like what you get. It can throw you off. So never ask the question of, for example, um, a person testifying on the other side why they did something or did not do something unless you know what they are going to say ahead of time because you may not like the answer that you get and it may not help you. Hopefully by the time you come to trial, you will know the answer to all of the questions in advance that you are going to ask on direct or cross. You're basically preparing that so that these witnesses can tell the trier of fact what it is that they need to uh, know in order to render a decision in favor of your client. And you're going to want to prepare your witnesses for direct or cross-examination. Now, that certainly doesn't mean you're going to do a trial run with your adversary's witnesses, but it does mean that you can actually sit down with your witness and go through these lists of questions and talk about how to answer those questions. Your witnesses, for the most part, are not people who are comfortable or familiar in a courtroom. If they're a fish out of water, and you can help them by giving them the plan ahead of time in terms of the questions that you are going to ask. Um, you don't necessarily need to stick to the script. You don't have to give the witness the script, and you certainly don't want your witness to get to the stand and have that script in his or her hand. But you do want to prepare the witness and explain what is going to happen and make them feel as comfortable as you possibly can in that setting. You may, for example, want your witness to go to the courthouse in advance to see what it looks like to see what the judge looks like um, if they've never met them and to just make sure that they know where they're going. You may want to prepare objections to your adversary's evidence. Assuming that your adversary has already disclosed to you what the documents are that they are going to try to admit 
into evidence or the testimony that they are going to try to have admitted in evidence, you need to think about whether you are going to um, have any objections and bring that to the judge's attention before the trial starts. You may want to draft what are known as in limine motions. Those are motions that generally are argued and briefed to the judge prior to the start of trial so that the judge can make rulings outside the presence of a jury and can talk about what kinds of evidence will be admitted and what kind of evidence may not be admitted. You're going to want to prepare an exhibit list and visual aids, what kind of um, documents are you going to try to bring in? Has the other side stipulated to those uh, exhibits as admissible, or are you going to need a witness to actually authenticate the document in order to have it admitted and to testify about that document? You're going to want to think about whether you want to have any demonstrative evidence. Do you want to prepare any charts, for example, of timeline? Or do you want to um, have any videotaped deposition shown? So think about these issues and try to streamline them as much as possible. There may be um, exhibits that will be joint exhibits. There may be facts that you and your adversary can stipulate to that uh, streamlines the issues so that you don't need to have witnesses authenticate or testify about these undisputed facts. And of course, you're going to want to draft an opening statement if your uh, court procedures allows you to have an opening statement. You're also going to have to prepare a brief if the court allows you to do that. And the brief generally, in this case, is going to talk about what it is that you are going to be attempting to prove at trial and how you're going to do that and how the law applies to the facts that you are going to introduce at trial. So most litigators prepare what is known as a trial notebook. And a trial notebook makes it very easy when you are in the courtroom to easily find what it is that you need to find in order to show an exhibit, for example, to a particular witness, to look at a deposition transcript, if, for example, the testimony of the witness is different from what the person testified to at the time of the deposition, and you want to use the deposition testimony to impeach the credibility of that witness who just testified at trial, it is much easier to keep track of documents when those documents are in some sort of um, tabbed notebook, if you're just going to bring in stacks of files, it is going to take a longer time for you to fish through um, the documents and find what you are looking for. If you're going to try the case in front of a jury, lots of times it's a turnoff for the members of the jury to watch an attorney fishing through their files looking for a particular document or evidence. They frankly just want to get their jury service out of the way and you are prolonging the agony by making the trial longer when you're fishing around. They don't think you're very organized and therefore they may not think that you're very good at what you're doing. Again, if you're lucky enough to have a paralegal or a legal assistant who can help you put together a trial notebook, then that is the perfect job um, for your staff. And this uh, slide shows the types of documents 
that you will want to put into your trial notebook. So you'll generally want the pleadings in the case. For example, the complaint, the answer, affidavit uh, that may have been filed. Um, you will want to make sure that you have your pretrial motions if you're going to be making any in the trial notebook. You will want to have your discovery responses in there from both sides, assuming that there are only two parties. If there are uh, discover, if there are more parties, and obviously you want all of that discovery because again, you may want to impeach the credibility of a witness through the testimony that um, is inconsistent with what they testified previously to. You will want a witness list. So, and you'll want it in an order, and you'll want to have their contact information so that if they don't show up, you could call them, or if the trial is running late, you can call them and let them know that they should come the next day or whatever um, is going on. You'll want to have your exhibit in the trial notebook so that you will be reminded of what it is that you need to prove your case and what you need to authenticate or to have a witness testify to, lay a foundation, if you will, so that you can have these pieces of the evidence admitted um, in the trial. You'll want copies of the deposition transcripts in your trial notebook for the same reason. You'll want to have any subpoenas issued because you may want to question the witnesses about these subpoenas. Now, in addition to um, discovery types of subpoenas, you may have to issue trial subpoenas to actually get the witnesses to appear at the trial. So if a witness has been subpoenaed and has not shown up, you will want copies of those subpoenas um, to deal with with the, uh, with the court. If you have research that you have done on the law and how the law applies to the facts, you'll want that in your trial notebook. You'll want to have note paper to make notes. In some cases, you may be able to bring a laptop with you to trial. Consider whether uh, what is the easiest way for you to take notes so that you can quickly look at things that you may want to change. You may want to add additional questions that you are going to add, um, ask a, a witness, or you may need to change something else. So make sure that you have note paper. If you have prepared direct and cross-examination questions for each of your witnesses with the exhibits to be introduced, you'll want to include that in your trial notebook. If you are allowed to have a jury trial, you're going to want to have a chart so that you can see the names of these various um, jury members. And if you are allowed to ask questions of the jury in a voir dire, you're going to want to have those questions as well. Um, also consider whether you are allowed to have exit questions of a jury and whether you're going to want to ask any of those. You're going to want to have your opening statement and your closing statement in this uh, trial notebook if you're allowed to have an opening statement and a closing statement. If you're going to have a jury, you're going to want to be armed with jury instruction. That generally will be submitted to the court because it's the court that is going to be submitting the jury instruction. If there are any stipulations of fact, you are going to want to have those included in your trial notebook, and you are certainly going to want to um, have a chronology um, as well. So at this juncture, um, we have a few minutes left, and I'd like to open the floor to any questions that you may have. 